verse 32, chapter 32, verse 1 is very significant. When Jacob leaves Laman, uh, Laban and heads down toward Canaan, it says, the angels of God met him. He had, a, he had a vision of angels going up and down a ladder in chapter 28. In chapter 32, he had another vision of angels, evidently angels in the form of armies, angels which formed a kind of armed escort. In chapter 28, he was running away from Esau. In chapter 32, he's going toward Esau. In chapter 28, he's trying to put distance between himself and Esau. In chapter 32, he's coming close to Esau, and it's going to be a big, big deal for these two brothers to face each other after 20 years. He's going to face a brother who was a great hunter, and he's going to face a brother who said, when our father dies, I'm going to kill you. So now he's coming back. He names the place where he saw the angels Mahanaim, Genesis 32.1, the place of the two camps. And then Jacob sends messengers to his, to his brother. Um, he says, I'm coming back and I'm going to give you gifts. And I hope that things go well with us. The messengers come back in, in verse 6 and they say, We saw Esau. He's coming out to meet you. And he's got 400 men with him. That's not good news. Jacob was coming to Esau with women and children and gifts. Esau is coming to Jacob with 400 men. And you can bet that those 400 men are well armed. Verse 7 says that Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Now listen. Jacob had received the word of the Lord. He received the word of the Lord in chapter 28. And he received the word of the Lord in chapter 31. And he received a vision of angels in chapter 32. Why is he afraid? because he also received word about Esau. Have you ever asked the question, where does faith come from? Why do some people have faith and some people don't have faith? Do you ever ask the question, where does fear come from? Why are some people afraid and some people are not afraid? Faith is a big word. Faith is so big that we have to use more than one word to represent the opposite of faith. In one way, the opposite of faith is unbelief. But in another way, the opposite of faith is fear. Fear. Jacob is afraid. Why? Because he was focusing on Esau and Esau's men and not the promise of God and God's angels. So Esau had 400 men, so what? Jacob had already seen the angels of God. Do you realize that in the Old Testament, in the generation of Elisha, I think it was Elisha, I'll have to look that up, one angel killed 185,000 Syrian soldiers. 185,000, one angel. Jacob had seen a whole group of angels. Why is he afraid of Esau's men? Jacob had received the word of God and the assurance of God's protection. Why is he afraid of what Esau can do? You know, you and I are either going to be afraid of what men can do or we're going to be afraid of what God can do. If we're afraid of what God can do, we're not going to be afraid of what men can do. If we're afraid of what men can do, we're not going to be afraid of what God can do. We have to make our choice. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah ran down a king whose name was Ahab. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah ran away from a queen 
whose name was, he, whose name was Jezebel. What was the difference? Why was Elijah so brave in 1 Kings 18 that he chased down a king? Why was he so afraid in the next chapter that he ran away from a woman? The difference was focus. What was he paying attention to? In 1 Kings 18, he's paying attention to the Word of God. In 1 Kings 19, he's paying attention to the Word of Jezebel. Romans 10, 17 says this. Where does faith come from? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. So if you pay attention to the Word of Christ, you grow in faith. If you pay attention to the threats of men, if you pay attention to the arguments of the devil, you grow in fear. That's the difference. It doesn't come from inside of you. It comes from outside of you. What are you paying attention to? God or the people who don't know God? At the moment of fear, Jacob is very cunning. He's very clever. So what he does in verse 7 and 8 is he divides his animals and his family into two companies. And here's his strategy. He says, if Esau kills us, somebody's going to get away. He's going to have to decide, am I going to chase this group or am I going to chase that group? Probably he won't be smart enough to chase both groups. He's got to decide which direction he's going to go in. He may not even know there are two groups. And so this is Jacob's plan. Now, um, at that moment in verse 9, Jacob begins to pray. And let's just say this, it's about time. It's about time. It's about time Jacob learns to pray. Here's our problem. Most of the time, we don't pray until the last minute. Most of the time, we don't pray until we don't have any choice but to pray. If we have another choice, we take the other choice instead of prayer. If we think the problem can be solved by money, we have faith in money. If we think the problem can be solved by our own wisdom, then we have faith in our wisdom. If we think the problem can be solved in somebody that we know or in a human being, then we have faith in the human being. It's only when we know that nothing is going to solve the problem except for God that we fall back on prayer. That's bad. We need to appeal to prayer first, prayer over money, prayer over personal wisdom, prayer over personal resources, prayer uh, over the strength of other people. Isaiah 2.22 says, Stop depending on other men who have their breath in their nostrils. Trust rather in God. So finally, Jacob begins to pray. It says in verse 9 uh, that Jacob cried out to the God of his father Abraham and Isaac. And it says in verse 11, Deliver me, I pray from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I'm afraid that he'll attack me, the mothers and the children. But here's what you said to me. Here's what you promised me. And so he prays based on the Word of God and on the promises of God. Faith grabs on to promise. Prayer quotes God to himself and says, you promised. There was an Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the Anglican Church, the head of the Church of England. There was an Archbishop of Canterbury named William Temple. He died in 1944. William Temple said, When I pray, amazing coincidences take place. When I don't pray, those coincidences do not take place. Twelve days ago, my wife and I were praying for friends of ours who have Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease is what you get when you get bitten by a tick, these little bugs out in the forest, an infected tick. 
can give you Lyme's disease. It's a terrible, terrible disease. It's very, very hard to get well. It usually takes years to get well. We have four friends in America who have Lyme's disease, and we were praying, praying, praying for those friends. And then I went to the train station. I had to travel to the Czech Republic. And at the train station, my train was late. It was three hours late. So I sat down, and there was a young man beside me. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a Bible teacher. He said, oh, I, I just came from my doctor. Now, first he said, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, but I live in Budapest. He said, I'm from Prague. I said, that's great. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm a Bible teacher. He said, I just came from my doctor, and he was telling me about Christianity. And I said, you live in Prague, but your doctor's in Budapest. He said, yes. I said, why do you go to the doctor in Budapest? He said, because I have Lyme's disease. We were just praying, just praying about that. And then something happened, just like that. Jacob is praying. Jacob is learning how to pray. He doesn't pray very much. He doesn't usually depend on prayer. He depends on himself. He's a young man. He's a strong man. He's a smart man, a clever man. He knows how to tell lies. He gets his way by telling clever lies and deceiving people. That's the way his uncle Laban gets his way. But now he prays. And when we pray, we have to tell the truth because God knows when we're lying. It doesn't do any good to lie to God because He knows the truth. So we may as well tell Him the truth. And Jacob begins to pray in verse 9, and he, he repeats God's promise back to him in verse 12. You promised me this. You said you were going to bless me and you were going to make me have lots and lots and lots and lots of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And Now my brother's coming after me, and he's bringing 400 men. And he's not bringing 400 men to have a birthday party and to cook food and to serve me. He's bringing 400 men to kill me. What are you going to do? How are you going to keep your promise if my brother's trying to kill me? That's what he's praying about. Now, um, Jacob doesn't just pray. He takes action. And so he divides. Um, so he, he, well, he begins to send gifts to his brother. And he actually sends five gifts. He sends um, goats, and he sends camels, and he sends cows, and he sends donkeys. And he has his servants bring one group of gifts. And so Esau receives these gifts from his brother. And then Esau travels a little bit further, and he receives another gift from his brother. And then Esau travels a little further. He receives another gift from his brother. Very, very clever. It's hard to kill somebody who's just sent you five gifts. Five gifts in a row. This, so Jacob is praying, but he's also, he's also taking action. He does something else in verse 22. Um, he begins to divide... He, he begins to divide his camp. He actually arranged the camp in verse, in chapter 33. We learn that he arranged his family so that if Esau killed anybody, he killed Leah first and Rachel last. Jacob is very naughty, but he's, he's thinking. And he thinks, if Esau's going to kill me, maybe I can make it so Rachel can get away. But before that happens in chapter 33, something else very important happens in chapter in chap at the end of chapter 32. Now, this is a very unusual portion of the Word of God. It's a very important part of the Word of God. It's not an easy part of the Word of God to understand. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. 
We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.